Hello and welcome to Cargo Masterminds presented by Cargo One. Cargo Masterminds is our exclusive one-to-one -one weekly interview series with the leaders from the world's leading air cargo and logistic companies. My name is Reggie John. He was a young investment banker in his early 20s, working on a project in 2012 for Tony Fernandez, the low-cost airline kingpin credited with revolutionizing budget air travel in Asia. Tony was trying to buy an airline in Indonesia and at some point he turned to the young investment banker and asked him to join AirAsia. But the young investment banker was in two minds as he had zero interest and experience in aviation. But Tony's offer was irresistible for the challenges and opportunities it offered. The rest is history for the now 35-year-old Pete Charong Wong Sok. From 2012 to 2016, Pete was AirAsia's group head of business development. During that time, he worked to set up airlines in India and Japan, as well as joint ventures in training, ground handling, and leasing. He also handled mergers and acquisitions for the group covering Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, and India. In 2018, at the age of 29, Pete became the CEO of AirAsia's cargo and logistic arm, Teleport. He was tasked with spearheading the company's transformation from a legacy business into a digital venture. The opportunity over the coming years was really to redefine what logistics looks like in the new world. And Teleport's ultimate goal is to disrupt the logistics sector by enabling everyone, from large companies to small business owners and individuals, to ship their parcels and products across Southeast Asia in 24 hours or less. Teleport CEO Pete joins me from Kuala Lumpur in this episode of Cargo Masterminds presented by Cargo One. Pete is also a board member of Teleport, Freight Chain Technologies, AirAsia India and EC Parcel. Pete, welcome to Cargo Masterminds. Great to have you for this conversation. Raji, thanks so much for having me. It felt like living through a lifetime movie, having to hear you introduce me in that way, but thank you for having me on on Cargo Masterminds, and hopefully I do justice to that introduction. Uh, it's only the beginning of the movie. I think you have uh, several years ahead of you. Uh, I gave you a picture of uh, how you started off. Let's hear it from you uh, briefly about the story of how you ended up being the CEO of Teleport, which is the digital air cargo and logistic arm of AirAsia. So I would say in short, a lot of luck and frankly, a lot of opportunity that, you know, you usually most of my peers are, you know, at least 20 years or more in the space and experience is the reasons for why they're there, right? And, and for good reason. But for me, my lack of experience is probably why I'm here and then also why we're trying to achieve what we're trying to achieve, which is, you know, how do we deliver everything uh, tomorrow? So it arrives tomorrow. That is entirely everything we do. Uh, whether it's moving large freight to or small packages end to end to the consumer. So I'm here because of a lack of experience. And my lack of experience comes from the fact that I understand what it feels like to live and work in parts of the world that are not my own, right? So I'm originally from Thailand, which is why you struggle to pronounce my last name. But uh, good shot. Nice try. Pretty good. But um, I left home when I was nine years old and I went to boarding school in Uttakamund. Tamil Nadu in uh, South India. Yeah, it shocks everybody every time uh, when I was 13 years old. And, you know, I went to boarding school for four years and then I went to university and I graduated as a chemical engineer. And I obviously didn't want to do anything engineering related because banking, investment banking, as you said, uh, sounds so much cooler and paid more money. So I did that, but then realized that really what was more important was actually learning how to how people build amazing businesses, right? And I think because the job is really to help customers and clients buy and sell companies and raise money and so on. But really what is behind all that is, you know, the CEOs, the entrepreneurs, as you said, that, you know, the, the larger than life personalities that build with businesses that actually impact a lot of people. So I had a luck chance of having the ability to work with someone like Tony. And, uh, and he, it was lucky that he took a chance on me and that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I had a lot of different experiences living in different parts of the world, doing different things. And ultimately, I brought that lack of experience to close my point off to Teleport because, you know, frankly, nobody can disrupt the best of breed in logistics, right? The DHL Expresses, the FedExes, the UPSs, 
Um, you know, the global freight forwarders, frankly, even some of the amazing air cargo carriers around the world, like it's not expected that they can be disrupted. So really only if you're an outsider and a little bit, frankly, naive, can you have a chance to try, which is what we're doing at Teleport. So that's why I'm here. And that's obviously why, you know, my lack of experience doesn't count against me. Pete, uh, in July this year, Teleport unveiled its uh, freighter fleet uh, with the first converted A321 freighter. And you're expected to have two more such converted freighters in your fleet uh, in the coming year. How important is it for Teleport to have its dedicated main deck capacity to leverage the current position that you hold in um, uh, Southeast Asia and the potential growth ambitions uh, in the years ahead? Well, it's important enough to include the model in the background, Araji. So it's pretty important. But I would say, why is it important to have greater capacity? I think it's because, you know, Southeast Asia or just kind of Asia in general lacks controlled capacity, right? So so Southeast Asia, frankly, more than 60 to 70% of the total available capacity is belly capacity. And most of that belly capacity is on low-cost carriers. Just how we started, right? Air Asia is the largest low-cost carrier in Southeast Asia. I think the problem with that, though there are many amazing things with belly capacity, is that a lot of customers don't believe you can deliver to the SLA that you promised them or, know, or the expectations they may have without you having some form of controlled capacity, right? And so we were always a belly player. We believe the future is mainly going to be belly, but really the full value of the network does require controlled capacity. That's why we've taken the A321 freighter and we've taken, obviously, as you said, three. Why three? Because, you know, we see an opportunity that Southeast Asia is not just one major large country, it's it's 10 countries. And so each country represents a base for where we could put aircraft and where we can actually operate a network that other people cannot operate because you literally have to have multiple airlines in different countries to do that, which we have the infrastructure under AirAsia. Why the 321F? Because this is one of the largest operators in the world of the Airbus 320 and 321 family. And so the best thing, best in cost, best in ecosystem of same pilots, maintenance, uh, common parts, common contracts, you know, common costs, common operations and standards exists already. So inducting this freighter into that ecosystem uh, allows us, frankly, to operate at the best cost structure possible. And I think, Raji, you know this more than me, the industry is going through a period where, you know, the yields are now kind of plummeting back to pre-COVID levels. And so what does that mean for, you know, most of the players that transport things for B2B by air? It means it's only if you have the cost structure and the network as well that can operate in any environment then really you are able to sustain and build a business uh, in this space that can actually do, do things that you want to do. So that's why hopefully it explains uh, why we take the freighters, Y3, Y321F, and obviously why now. Pete, uh, give me a timeline about the, your second and the third freighters in terms of the delivery and uh, adding into your fleet. And you said it will be operated from three different uh, countries or three different hubs. Where will they be? The second and third, the first one is out of Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, so the... The second freighter, very specific timeline, November 1, 2023. So, so about uh, sort of uh, 20 days from now, right? 20, 21 days from now. So that's that's that. And that will be based in Kuala Lumpur, but it will operate on a rotation out of Kuala Lumpur doing domestic and international, you know, collectively as the, as an overall run. And, and it will touch Hong Kong and eventually it will touch uh, the South China, broadly Shenzhen and Guangzhou as well. So that's the second freighter, November 1, 2023. The third freighter is somewhere in December 2023. It's got to obviously complete the entire checks and handover. So that one really will depend on exactly how we can uh, and receive and induct that aircraft, but effectively sometime in December. But that one, we're looking at potentially putting that in another hub, I think, Penan, or the wild card that I had said before was in Manila. And the goal here really is to figure out how to maximize our network rally where we kind of reach it today with Belly. So... Those are two two big candidates uh, for where the third freighter. Hypothetically, Peter, if you see an uptick in the market in terms of freight rates, increasing yields going up, uh, do you intend to or do you have a plan for additional freighters to join your fleet 2024-2025? Uh, yeah, good question. I would say that someone told me once who was much wiser than me that hope is not a strategy. 
So I can't build a plan of number of freighters to adopt in 2024 and 2025 on the hope that yields rise. Uh, so then the only question here is how many freighters can I take assuming yields don't rise and then market conditions don't improve? I think the key here is where do I see opportunity where we're filling out our belly already to the point where we have to graduate that volume to a controlled capacity on a freighter? And at the moment, I do see that an opportunity across all our markets. And the key here is that and availability is not a concern now. It looks like there's a lot of freighters potentially in the market that can be converted. I think the key here is now when are those you know, points where I expect that the demand is overcome the little belly capacity on those ladies today. And I, I think, as I had said before, we're looking at 10 in total over the next two years. But realistically, it will really depend on uh, you know how the market shapes up in terms of how much volume might Give us an update on the 737-800 freighter launched in November 2021. This was an aircraft acquired through a multi-year agreement with K-Mile Asia, a Thailand-based uh, express freight airline. Uh, is that still part of your fleet? Uh, and uh, do you intend to change the aircraft type as well from uh, in case if you have more uh, freighters joining? Sure. Well, obviously, the, well, it was the 737-800F. But I would say that you know it's been less about the aircraft type, right? It matters about the aircraft type if we put it into AirAsia's ecosystem. But we also have shown, as you pointed out, that we can use third-party airlines aggressively uh, to operate on our network as long as it extends our network. And in this case, you know, came out did do that out of Bangkok, all right? That the contract is now terminated because, frankly, by the time that aircraft could fly, you know, it just didn't make any sense anymore uh, based on when we secured it. And, and it, there really was loads of issues in COVID, one of them being permits. So that contract, we no longer operate, but we still maintain a relationship with KMIL and we've been talking to them about doing other rotations for us. Uh, we do know where that aircraft is being placed now. Uh, and that's being placed with some of our, shall we say, friends and uh, competition and collaborators. So I, I do think, watch this space. We do think that there's a lot of capacity available and we want to contract them at the right price. Uh, so that's really ultimately what's going to determine that, you know, whether we'd be comfortable to use another aircraft type 7767. I mean, 70% of the freighter market is frankly the, the Boeing variant. So obviously it makes sense at some point not to be limited by air. Pete, tell us about uh, how extensive is your uh, freighter network is today. Of course, you operate just one. Uh, so if you can give me a, a sense of uh, the network that you operate right now. Okay, so a couple of things to say on network. Firstly, the fact that we can put them in different countries it matters to how, how wide this network is, right? The hubs that they operate from. And needless to say, you know, Southeast Asia is complex. So you have to place them in different places where uh, people can ultimately not replicate your freighter strategy, right? So in this case, we're thinking about multi country, multi hub within a single country like KL and Penang and eventually also Manila. So that's the first consideration for a freighter extensivity of the network. The second is, you know, we run these freighters 10 hours a day. Uh, so a lot of people don't really do that, but we do. I think we've maybe from the DNA of low cost carriers of sweating your asset to, to, to pay for your fixed cost, we run them 10 hours a day. So we're doing, you know, north of 300 hours a month. So that really requires us to balance pretty long rotations you know, to do so, right? And so really you're going to see a lot of that play out in terms of China capacity. I think that's critical for us because China is about four hours away. That's really where most of the e-commerce is and supply chain still originates. But also it comes through Southeast Asia a fair amount and increasingly so now with some of the macro uh, chain visiting the China plus one strategy and so on for many shippers, many borders. And so you're going to see a lot of it be a lot of sweating of the assets. So again, 300 hours a month, flying really a lot of longer sectors China runs across a diverse set of hubs. Uh, so that means effectively, you're not going to see many new stations, Rajin. You're not going to see us flying to some random places with the freight for that today, the belly doesn't reach. But it's really reinforcing that because I think, you know, this game is really around scales. So if you don't have like hundreds of freighters, then you should have lots of frequencies to the same critical hubs. And then the last point to say is, you know, everybody cares about reliability, right? When you operate a freighter. So if you don't have redundancy of capacity, so for example, if we fly out of Hong Kong, you know, six times a day with the belly and three times a day with the freighter, then we have a few options to make sure that we're always reliable for our customers. And so I think that's a key strategy of how we operate the network. So, you know, short of me showing you a schedule, which is you know less fun, uh, I can show that answer that question. 
Since we are talking about the asset utilization, you said about 10 hours, 300 hours uh, in a month. What kind of load factors are you seeing on it? Well, it's going to be north of 80% for us to have any chance to operate this thing economically. Now, what we're seeing today is that the 80% is not evenly distributed, right? So if, for example, we operate a triangle, so we operate A to B, you know, B to C and C to A, two of those legs are pretty easy to get to above 90% consistently. That's good. It's the third leg, which ultimately we need to get it above 60% so that the overall aggregate around or the So that's critical. And in the freighter, uh, the 321F, we basically got 14 you know, main deck positions at that lower deck. So that's 24 positions that we have to try to maximize the mix of e-commerce, the mix of e-commerce plus hard freight. So, you know, really the game is to maximize the load factor of the rotation. We see that the the only challenge really is on one leg. And the reason for why that one leg is hard is because you have to make the timings work for all three legs. And ultimately, that's what we're, we're, we're basically not changing our rotation, changing our timings all the time to optimize for this. And so in this case, we see a clear line of path to 80% utilization of this quarter. Pete, the question that, that I have next is uh, the timing of the launch of your freighter network, freighter service. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that was appropriate? Um, the market condition had been quite brutal in terms of rates. Um, so you started at the rock bottom, so the chances in the future is only go up and up. Well, I think you sound like a glass half full person, so that's that's my type of person. But, but effectively, most people see induction of freighters at the time of rock bottom race as maybe bullish. I would say this is the time in which other people are retreating and we're able to take share. So I would see that as an opportunity and obviously, you know, economic you know, conditions matter, but ultimately the belly space is really what enabled us to take freighter space in the first place. Uh, and so, you know, it's all about the fact that we were sitting on belly space that we can graduate beyond belly space to freighter space. And so therefore the timing for us is really less about when the market conditions are right. It's more about when are we ready to graduate to freighters? And I think we discovered that that was now. And if we can make this work, as you asked me earlier, 80% utilization and so on, in this rock bottom environment, then yes, it's only up from here. Uh, Pete, Teleport also has been entering into partnership with uh, other cargo airlines in the region. You had one going on with uh, Pradhan Air Express in India, Garuda in Indonesia, and the recent one with uh, SF Airlines in China. How significant are these for your business and growth strategy? It's significant. I mean, I think our next 24 months calls for... 40% of our growth to be driven by third-party airlines. And the reason for that is because this industry doesn't generally share network and generally doesn't share, you know, kind of planning and solutioning for how to integrate that world. And so the, the outcome of that is that everybody's worse off. Like everybody's not at the utilization they should be because we just have this maybe, you know, trust and or legacy mindset of not wanting to share. And I would say that what's critical for us is to break that, to break that for guys that represent the absolute best in class, players like Garuda, you know, or SF Airlines and many others. Some of you know, we have 30 in total that some of them don't want to be talked about for a reason. And so my reason for deriving this is not just because we want to grow, I even need 40% of our capacity to come from elsewhere. But also that, you know, we discover that when we put network together and we can actually make it work, right? We talk about this one airway bill that can go through any number of pipes, any number of airlines from A, any point from A to B across the network and no one would know any different. If we can make that work, we've discovered that everybody's better off. Like you can attract demand, you can convert demand, you can actually reroute demand in a way that, that you couldn't have done if two airlines didn't decide to partner together and therefore the airlines could partner together and so on. So actually everybody's better off and everybody stays that very sticky to that commercial partnership or everybody wants more, um, which is exactly where I think we want the industry to go because honestly, there are enough planes in the sky. There are enough freighters in the world and there's enough deadly capacity available. The key is how do we sweat the assets? How do we utilize the assets in a way that today, you know, is not the norm in the industry. Pete, uh, the region that you operate in is so critical to global trade, particularly cross-border e-commerce cargo. You mentioned about China plus one strategy. 
the geopolitical conditions, uh, de-risking of global supply chain, diversification of manufacturing. Uh, what are some of the other big tailwinds for uh, teleport? I think e-commerce is obvious, and that's something we want to double triple down on. I think that's where, A, a lot of our competitors don't want to compete on. E-commerce is, in many ways, synonymous with price and speed all at the same time done for many, many small packages. And so if you're comfortable moving large pallets, charging $10,000 a pallet, why on earth would you bother to charge $1 per parcel? And so, you know, we believe though, that is our opening. That's our opportunity because e-commerce is growing 30% a year and one in five e-commerce shipments cost more to use air. And that's only just increased in terms of use. So that's critical. And IATS has been writing about this for like 25 years. So it's about high time we did something about it um, as an industry, right? In terms of addressing this opportunity in e-commerce through air. So that's where we see the first. And that's just because the macro is that it's growing 30% a year. The air freight business by volume grows 5%. So really, if you're going to disrupt, you're going to really want to align with where the opportunity is, which is where the market is growing. That's one. Two is I think the express players, the integrators uh, globally, I don't have to name them by name, it's only three plus maybe one or two more. Um, effectively are growing because they're charging more per parcel, per package. They're promising great service and they deliver great service, but frankly, they charge more and more. Like, I mean, it's pretty obvious that every year the, the price per package goes up maybe a couple of percentage points and maybe over two years, maybe from seven to 10 percentage points. So that's just unsustainable in our view. And obviously we believe there are better ways to deliver something the next day at a fraction of the cost. And that's frankly, realizing the opportunity of belly space that we have today to connect regions. So that's the second big one. And then the third is, you know, Southeast Asia is four hours away from, frankly, where most things are manufactured and most e-commerce is made. So if cross-border e-commerce is going to realize full potential, it's going to be in our backyard, right? It's going to be here for, we're only four hours away. You don't have to wait 72 hours or more uh, to get your uh, commerce order to door. And frankly, you shouldn't have to wait to go from like, you know, a uh, manufacturing spot in China through maybe 10 different hands to come to your door. It doesn't have to flow through that operating model. So we think the third tailwind is really the reordering of, of you know, kind of supply chains that we've seen already with, you know, direct-to-consumer models, Shein. We see it also with, you know, kind of TikTok and, and kind of, you know, direct kind of social commerce to a consumer from a live seller who helps use it directly to supply. So we're seeing models change and we think we're aligned with that because frankly, to fly from A to B, for us, point to point is something that our network provides already. So it's a case of enabling that end to end, which we're trying to do and we're actively trying to do. So that's the third. And then maybe the last one is that China plus one you mentioned is, is important, but I think what's critical is that no one can really replicate overnight the infrastructure that exists today across China that is serves in you know, globally kind of everybody so well. So I think the key is that a lot of people want to, you know, kind of diversify supply chain, but they also want somebody who they know will be part of the solution. Like they're actually going to be able to offer something to kind of allow them to be more efficient uh, as they diversify, but also maybe just solve a problem for them in a way that, you know, a general 3PL would, right? Usually a 3PL is I tell you to do something you do it. But generally, I think the expectation now as people who diversify their supply chain is also, look, what can you do for me? Tell me how you can help me. That kind of conversation generally is where some of these partnerships are offer opportunity. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think maybe you've seen a few examples with other airlines, but I think we're also seeing it directly with other shippers. So I would say those are the four, like dealing directly with shippers is something that generally most people don't do, right? It's a 3PL, you we contract with a freight forwarder and that's what it is. But I think we also see that shippers, frankly, want solutions. So they do want to talk to transport. A bit besides e-commerce cargo, what are some of the other cargo commodity verticals that Teleport is building? Yeah, so e-commerce is our number one focus. Uh, so we can make sure that the 2 million e-commerce parcels that come from China and Southeast Asia every day by air flow to us first. And that's, that's good. We're also building multimodal capability, right? So I don't know if you know this today, but we do custom square and express players ourselves. We do trucking ourselves. We do that end to end movement all the way through to last mile drivers and riders. So we're investing a lot in multimodal infrastructure, 
But in terms of commodity types, it's still centered around e-commerce. I do think there's an opportunity in perishables and frankly, in you know, kind of time sensitive matters. Like you know, we sit on the doorstep of of a, a huge demanding customer, Air Asia, that needs to bring supply chain parts, you know, time sensitive, critical AOG parts in all the time. We see it up close every day. We don't dare touch it, but we see it. And so we realize that at the end of the day, we're really good at what we do. Actually, we can get to the point that we can actually enable, you know, people that have time criticality, right? It arrives tomorrow, but really at the point that they need, you know, that reliably done across a, a huge array of uh, sources of supply right across the region. So I think those are the two, right? I guess ultimately perishables and really true time sensitive kind of matters that are high value. Teleport uh, combines the Billy Cargo capacity of uh, all Air Asia passenger network. Uh, give us a sense of the annual available cargo capacity and what is the annual cargo tonnage for Teleport? Well, we're talking about, you know, one and a half to two million available tons. Um, so, hell of a lot. And our utilization is about 20% of that. There's a long way to go. And I think that's why we're excited about the opportunity, right? Firstly, you know, we're already the largest by volume in Southeast Asia. But that's just one, you know, step it's not of many. I think that it, I think we realized that at the end of the day, the big picture is you know, Air Asia alone has one and a half million tons, depending on full recovery of the obviously the aircraft network, but around that range of available available surplus uh, belly capacity. And today we use about twenty percent. So there's a long way to go. There's a lot of opportunity to come. But we also realized that the way to get there is to also tap into third party airline capacity, so that we can actually drive more connectivity and volume into the underutilized parts of the Air Asia network. So that's really what we're trying to do. And hopefully that gives you a sense of how much uh, volume we can actually enable. Pete, you mentioned about um, access to main deck capacity. Give us a sense of uh, of what you are reading in terms of the changing relationship with forwarders and shippers in the volatile market conditions. Uh, are there long-term contracts that you get in with shippers, forwarders? There are some, but I would say most people are in the wait and see mode, right? And I think rightfully so. If you and me could predict the future where we would be, you know, six to 12 months or 18 months or 24 months from now, firstly, there's better ways to make money than to lock in contracts. We can go and go to the betting house and make and make some bets, right? But the reality is no one really knows how deep this current market environment goes and, and everyone's hopeful for the best, but no one really knows. So uh, we don't see much long-term contracts materializing, we actually see a lot of people waiting and seeing, and that's fair. I mean, that's normal. I think what's key would be who knows, who has the data as to where you know, recovery really is, and that's really with the shippers. So our goal really is to say that if, as an industry, we're going to be better off. Shippers and, and transporters need to have more of a relationship because shippers control all the data in terms of recovery, in terms of demand, in terms of you know where demand is uh, shifting and flowing. And transporters like us trying to second guess where that is. And so ultimately, the only way to bridge that is to figure out how to add value, you know, obviously with borders, but also, you know, have conversations with shippers to discuss how we can enable that. So that's one. Two is I think, you know, this whole phenomenon of like low cost carrier belly space and having global freight forwarders use it, you know, reliably is something that's pretty new, I think, to most. Right, I think the last count, low cost carriers moved about one percent of air freight volumes globally. So it's not like we are the default of choice. So what do we have in our favor at this point? We have a network, and we have the ability to deliver cost competitiveness. And really, if we're good, we can still deliver reliability. So I think a big shift for us is also to convince, you know, large top fifteen, top twenty, top twenty five, top fifteen global freight porters that we're just as good. We're more fun and we're cheaper and better so that even in a tough environment, uh, we're helping them solve their problems. So I think that's really the challenge and the trends that are happening on our What is your sense about the global air cargo market? And um, can I ask you, like, do you expect a peak season this year? Is it a peak season at all? And when do you expect cargo wheels to uh, begin to improve? I think the consensus is that, let me answer those questions maybe one by one, but let's say the peak season one is the easiest one first. Do I expect a peak season? Again, hope is not a strategy, and mo most people would say there is a lack of a peak season on the horizon, but I'm going to take a call that there is a peak season, and it, it will be strong, uh, stronger than expected. Let's put it that way. I would say stronger than expected. So that has the opportunity to surprise on the upside. So I think we're, we're gearing up for that. I do see that you know, e-commerce is really the leading indicator of how strong it will be, and we've seen that hold up pretty well so far. So that's why I bet on a peak season uh, to be stronger than expected.
Uh, that's one. What's the future of air cargo? That's a loaded question, Raji. I think you, you're really not giving me any easy questions at all. But I would say the future cannot be value driven, like in terms of it cannot be yield driven. You know, there's you know, the underlying volume economics of this industry has been materially changed for 15 to 20 years. And that can't be if air cargo is going to receive widespread adoption, right? In multiple use cases, whether it's e-commerce or other things. And the fact of the matter is, and I've said this before, if I was in the airline business and my utilization of my metal, my asset was 30% or 40%, which is roughly the industry average for belly capacity use for air freight, I would be out of a job before I reached the age of 35, right? But here I, I seem to have a job. And the point here is because the, you know, the future is about you know, not just having, adding more planes to the fleet, it's utilizing existing assets to network collaboratively and better. And I think everything points to that being the case. And, you know, whether that's technology that enables any shipper, for example, cargo dot one, right? Shipper off order to book space, you know, on any available piece of capacity lane or network. I mean, so I'm plugging cargo dot one for free here, but that's an example of, you know, things that are changed that will enable the underlying notion of, you know, kind of volume and the use of air cargo to be more broadly being used and accepted to be, you know, the case. I think that has to be the case. You can't keep extracting prices. I mean, I think the dreaded word this year that we all hate is inflation. And certainly one key component of inflation is fuel costs and transport costs. And so we really cannot live as an industry on, you know, yield speed where we want it to be for our cost structure. It's got to be what allows more people to use air freight for a lot of different cases. That means ultimately we have to think of new ways to do business in this space. So I think that's the broad idea, I think, of the future of air cargo. I think it has to be more accessible. And ultimately, that you know, ultimately it's not about assets. It's about sweating the assets better. I think the age of sustainability also means, hey, you know, the justifying more jet fuel consumption is something that, you know, is always going to be under the microscope. So the question here is, you know, is that really the only option, right? To, to see how many more freighters convert over the next 30 years or and so on. And that being the hope and prayer of how this industry goes. I don't think that makes sense. Um, I think to answer your question about other features of, you know, kind of air cargo, air freight, I think it's high time we took technology a little more seriously. Uh, as an industry, I think if you and me can have a conversation in two different parts of the world, uh, in real time on Zoom. Uh, a lot of the problems we need to solve in air cargo in terms of visibility, track and trace, less paper, you know, kind of uh, more robust, you know, information exchange, uh, settlement, all these things are not things that have not been solved elsewhere. Uh, it's just about whether we have the willingness to adopt things that make sense, even if it costs a little bit more upfront to implement, right? And that create change. I don't think we like change so much in this industry. So I would say that is a key trend that I think is irreversible. Just the reality is you can't reverse the tide of, of of things that become easier to use and more accessible. So I think that's a key trend. Well, from very early on, Teleport positioned itself as a hardcore technology-enabled platform in cargo and logistics right from the start 2018. Tell us about your digital technology support uh, that has smart cargo-powered booking platform. You did mention in the, your previous answer about data sharing, where the data is lying, you don't have access to data. Data is with the shippers. Uh, how do we actually exchange data and really have a sense of what the demand and what the market conditions are in the market? Um, so tell us about how digital is the backbone foundation for Teleport. I think many people will answer this with a lot of fluffy words and nice initiatives and stuff. I'll try and answer it as, as openly as possible, which is that you know the problem we're trying to solve with technology uh, and everything we're trying to do with tech is visibility, right? So I can't have a conversation with a shipper if I can't bring visibility to the table. So first, I've got to make sure my entire ecosystem is visible to myself. And then maybe then I can bring visibility to somebody else and then have a conversation about data sharing and all these other things, right? Great things that we can do. So I think that's really the problem I'm trying to solve. Mark Cargo is one small component of the overall component of visibility because at the end of the day, if I'm doing more end-to-end -end business, it's visibility across that entire kind of spectrum of things that I do. And smart cargo only gives me visibility in and out of an airport, right? Really doesn't give me more visibility than that. 
I still have to solve the problem. How do I give visibility as to when the aircraft takes off so that the shipper knows exactly that it's taken off on time without having to get somebody in the warehouse, take a picture of the plane, right? And had a rudimentary things like that. How do I make sure that I know for sure that in a gunny bag that has a bag seal tag of X that is supposed to have, you know, 25 consignment notes of A to Z plus plus, uh, that is actually true. And that actually it's being loaded as per priority. That's visibility that I have to solve for myself first before I can really solve it and bring, and bring that to showcase elsewhere. How do I do this in a way that is not manpower intensive, where everybody has to scan every single thing, right? I think we do about 120 to 130,000 e-commerce parcels a day now, which is a huge amount of volume to scan manually one by one. So how do we do this in a way that is more efficient than that? So really, that's the, the whole thrust of technology. Smart cargo gives me the airport, air to, airport to airport visibility. But really, I'm building end-to-end -end visibility across many different handover points that I do. And so only when I solve visibility can I bring it back to the customer and have a conversation around data sharing. Peter, I want to sign off this interview with uh, your medium to long-term vision for Teleport. You are a young and smart CEO with a vibrant team and the market area and market is pretty large and huge for you. You said that um, you're 34, uh, you still have a job and you will have a job for either the several more years uh, because the market uh, that you're working is really exciting and it, it gives you a lot of challenges for you to innovate. Uh, give me a sense of your medium to long-term vision for Teleport. Yep. Uh, well, firstly, I, I would love to take credit, but I am 35, so I'm not 34, so a bit older. But I would say your point remains that there's so much to do. In this business. And so really the media to long-term ambition is that the next time we meet, uh, you will say two things to me. Uh, one is, I used your service, I teleported it. That would be one. And so when people say that with synonymous with our service, I think we've made it. And I think the second thing is if you say to me that, you know, everything around what you do is it arrives tomorrow, then I know we've actually delivered on that. And people don't really believe it, that everything we do arrives tomorrow, right? Arrives in 24 hours or less. Uh, so we've got to go out there and prove it. So the medium to long-term ambition is really quite simple. Is if we've used, if a lot of people have used us, they will say they teleported it. It will become a verb. Uh, so we have to get to that point. Uh, that it got to that wide adoption. If we only serve a limited pool of freight forwarders and shippers, we will never get widespread adoption, right? They will call us other things. They will not say they teleported. So it's got to be used and accessible for any business, any shipper, that's really where the medium to long-term ambition is the go-to choice, you know, any kind of business, large or small. The second thing is if ever someone asks me for a contract, like as to, okay, tell me all your range of services, what's your SLA, what's the percentage reliability? And I just say, look, if you use us for anything at all, it arrives tomorrow. And they're like, yeah, I know it arrives tomorrow, done, set to last on the contract. Then I think we've simplified the business. We've disrupted the business by simplifying. So I think that's the medium to long-term goal. With the go-to choice, anybody can use us. It's affordable. It works. And ultimately, everything can rise tomorrow. Peter, thank you so much uh, for that fascinating conversation. Uh, really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on Masterminds. I'm not sure I am a mastermind, but I do work in card. That was Pete Cherong Wong Sak, Chief Executive Officer of Teleport. I hope you enjoyed watching this interview. If yes, like, comment, share, and recommend this video to your friends. And more important, if you're not a subscriber of our YouTube channel, please do subscribe now and click the bell icon so that you do not miss any of our new videos. An audio podcast of the series is available on Spotify and on Amazon Music. I highly recommend you to check them out. Join me next Monday for another episode of Cargo Masterminds presented by Cargo One. Until we meet again, have a great week ahead. Thank you.